More than a dozen dead dogs found in a local creek. Months after KXAN first reported this story, police have now made two arrests. The discovery officers made when they found their suspects. A cold front moving through the state right now will usher in the coldest lows and highs of the season. We'll show you the numbers for where you live in first warning weather. From 1965 to today is like the dark ages to the modern world. Tonight, our investigation into a Hill Country mystery continues. A young girl's strangulation leads our team to uncover a statewide system for investigating death. Critics say is long overdue for an update. Gagsan investigates a hanging on Backbone Creek coming up. A pair of arrests in connection to more than a dozen dogs found dead in a South Austin Creek. Thank you for joining us tonight at 10. I'm Daniel Marine. And I'm Jennifer Sanders. Two men face a slew of animal cruelty charges and an additional felony charge in this case. Cape Sands' Brianna Hollis takes us to where the crime happened. Since April, people living near Shiloh Drive have worried about the grisly discovery of a group of dead dogs dumped in South Boggy Creek. I'm hoping it's not somebody that actually lives in the neighborhood. Police have now arrested two men who used to live at a house right by the trail's entrance. Neighbors say what they saw here that day in April horrified them. Some of the pictures they sent in, too gruesome for us to air. And now, seven months later, we now have more answers about what happened. Fred Reese and Rafael Bias Reese each face a felony charge of intentional or knowing unauthorized discharge. This stems from the dogs being placed in the waterway. They also each face at least a dozen animal cruelty charges. I'm glad that, you know, that was been taken care of. The community, outraged by the case, held a vigil days after they found the animals. Police say the men they believe are responsible moved to Cameron the day before the dogs were discovered, quote, surrounded by household trash consistent with cleaning out a home before moving out. Investigators say they found more dead animals in the freezer of the suspect's new house. Under Texas law, they could face up to a year in jail for each animal cruelty charge and up to 10 years for the illegal dumping charge. People who walk the creek say the news brings them at least some peace of mind as they take their daily strolls past the scene of the crime. Brianna Hollis, KXAN News. Attorney information for both suspects is not yet available, but we will reach out when that does change. A state law passed last year does bar those convicted of animal cruelty from owning animals for at least five years. Still, Texans can shoot their dogs under certain conditions. State law says dogs are considered property, but an owner can only shoot and kill a dog if it is done so humanely. And shooting a dog can be legally justified if it is a danger to you, others, or other animals. The Texas General Land Office is offering President-elect Donald Trump a 1,400-acre ranch as a site to build detention centers for his promised mass deportations of undocumented immigrants. Commissioner Don Buckingham sent a letter to the incoming president, and we told you last month the state purchased a ranch in Star County, that's in South Texas. In a response posted on social media about the letter, Buckingham said she was fully committed to using every tool at her disposal to help Trump keep American families safe. A Trump spokesperson has not yet responded for comment. 50s and 60s for most of us right now. It is not that chilly yet. The reason is... Our cold front is not here yet, should be here in a few hours time. Right now it's sitting roughly between Waco and Dallas. Certainly it's cleared through Abilene. Midlands dropped to the 40s. Amarillo in the mid 30s now. And that's the type of chilly air that's eventually coming here. We'll get down to 48 as we start off tomorrow morning. Completely clear sky tonight. By the way, that 48 will feel colder than 48 because the wind will pick up overnight giving us sort of a wind chilly beginning to your morning tomorrow. Coming up in first warning weather, we'll update you on the timeline of that cold front arriving after midnight and the impacts, including a breezy and cool Wednesday and the potential for some frost or even a light freeze for some of us later this week. Tonight, we continue our KXAN investigation into a Hill Country mystery 
nearly 60 years old. It just seemed more of a fanciful cover-up, if nothing else. Politics and an antiquated statewide system. We take a closer look at the unique power a Texas Justice of the Peace holds and how their decisions can determine the course of a death investigation. There was an undercurrent somewhere, somehow, that must have caused this to happen, because I don't think she died by her own hand. I'm KXAN investigator Josh Hinkle, joined by KXAN investigator Arzo Dost. That investigation, a hanging on Backbone Creek, continues coming up. Ronnie, do you remember these picture days? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is just out of the front door That's of this building. It was an innocent time in our lives. This is day nine. This would have been the eighth grade. The pictures were taken at the very start of the school year. This would have been in the fall. September yeah. of, of 65, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So she would have gotten this picture and then passed away a few months later. Yes. Within weeks. And it's just like all those things that she probably dreamed about just stopped that day. My name is Darlene Farmer Ostermeyer. I'm currently vice chairman of the Falls in the Colorado Museum that tries to depict the Central Texas era through time. What is the significance of this building to you? This building is actually the heartbeat of Marble Falls. It became the first school for Marble Falls in 1907. Can you imagine all of the feet that have walked on these wooden floors? That to me is just telling. We've been looking at the case from 1965. You were related to Danon, right? Yes, she was um, a second cousin. Her grandmother and my grandmother were sisters. She was a couple of years younger than I, and she had beautiful blonde hair, and she was extremely quiet. I mean, she bordering on shy. What did you think when you heard what had happened? I think Danon was such an innocent soul. It kind of shattered our family. I heard she was found hanging, that she had hanged herself with a rope, and it just didn't make any sense. A young girl that probably had thoughts of grandeur and growing and high school and dating and all those things so much in front of her that it just didn't seem conceivable. Then in the years since, have there been thoughts about what could have happened? My grandmother had certain theories and some of them are very unpleasant to think about. I think she probably knew of some undercurrents that I was not privy to as a 15 year old, one of which might be the truth other than what was listed on the death certificate. You know, the fact that it was ruled an accident doesn't sit well with a lot of people. My family always thought something wasn't quite right. Maybe we could have gotten some different and better answers, and maybe we could found the truth. Not far from the old schoolhouse, which is now the museum, Backbone Creek snakes through the city, just feet from where Danon Lewis lived and died in 1965 in the Burnett County Precinct, overseen by Justice of the Peace, C.B. Wall. Danon was buried less than 48 hours after her death. Judge Wall closed the investigation a week later, never ordering an autopsy, which would have provided medical proof of how she died. And the expert tells us a justice of the peace today would be far more likely to order an autopsy in a case like this. My name is Judge Rick Hill, Brazos County, Justice of the Peace, Precinct 3. What are the qualifications to be a Justice of the Peace in Texas? To get elected JP in the state of Texas, basically you have to have a pulse, all right? You have to be 18 years of age. You have to live in the county for 12 months in the precinct that you're going to serve for six months, not be a convicted felon, and be mentally competent. And so as long as you can keep uh, getting elected, you can stay in office. There are many JPs in Texas. About 900 JPs in 254 counties. JPs date back 200 years in Texas. Archives reference them well before statehood, since the earliest days of the colony, introduced by a man known as 
the father of Texas, Stephen F. Austin, in 1824. Justices of the Peace, historically, are individuals in a community where if a cow wandered over into somebody else's property and there was an argument over who the cow belonged to, went to a Justice of the Peace. How has the Justice of the Peace system evolved? 90% of all the cases filed at any level in the state of Texas are filed at our level. We do small claims cases. We do all the evictions in Texas. We do truancy, counties that don't have a medical examiner's office. We do the death inquests. Texas is unique with that last responsibility. Many states primarily use elected or appointed officials called coroners who have some training to investigate and certify deaths. Some primarily use medical examiners, doctors who've studied forensic pathology to conduct autopsies for that purpose. And a handful of states primarily use other elected officials to act as coroners, including Texas, which is the only one to specifically utilize justices of the peace. There are medical examiners here, but only in 14 counties. The rest rely on JPs to carry out that coroner role on top of all their other duties. They're not required to have medical training like a doctor, though they can contract for autopsies in counties with medical examiners or private entities, but often that does not happen. Take Burnett County, where Danon Lewis died. In the past five years, JPs there have investigated nearly 800 deaths, deciding to send fewer than half elsewhere for autopsies. When an unattended death happens, we have final say over everyone on whether an autopsy is done or not. We consult with law enforcement, medical personnel, family members, and given the circumstances, we order autopsies or not. You know, if it's an unnatural death, suicides, homicides, traffic fatalities, uh, young people who really we don't know what happened, you order an autopsy. Sending out for autopsies can be costly. We've seen counties pay as much as $4,700 per body. That decision is why, in part, JPs rely on the Texas Justice Court Training Center, where Judge Rick Hill teaches the many responsibilities of this role. Every Justice of the Peace goes through 80 hours of initial training. And then we are required by law to get 20 hours of concurrent training every year. Does that include death investigations? Almost every training has some sort of death investigation piece. What we teach judges is given the circumstances, are you comfortable enough coming up with a manner of death, cause of death? We train judges to say, you know what, if an autopsy is needed, you order one. Back in the day when the training center wasn't in existence, JPs were elected to office. You got the keys and it was like, good luck, here you go. From 1965 to today is like the dark ages to the modern world. In 1965, the training center didn't exist. In fact, it was only that year Texans first had a way to officially complain about judges through the newly created State Commission on Judicial Conduct. You can actually report judges for conduct that you think would be not becoming of a judge. There are some judges who have been removed from office, suspended from office. In fact, the commission's handed down more than 400 disciplinary actions against JPs since 2001, some related to death inquests. What do you say to people who say it's time to change the way Texas determines cause and manner of death, that it's a process that shouldn't be left up to justice of the peace? You know, I don't know what that would look like because hundreds of JPs do inquests. I would think that that boils down to resources. There are counties that have become quite populous and JPs are doing lots of inquests. That's one reason a handful of Texas counties, including Judge Hills, are now choosing to fund their own medical examiner office in the near future. State lawmakers made it tougher in recent years to require more counties to get a medical examiner, but after our questions, that could change next legislative session needs for having a proper medical examiner is something that is unfortunately in demand. Your JPs are being overwhelmed because of the workload that they have. Well, then it's time to take action. Online now, a hanging on Backbone Creek, the complete digital investigation. 
Watch the entire docuseries, explore the Danon Lewis mystery and other reports on Texas's justice of the peace system, and more, including an update on how our questions could soon lead to change at the state capitol. And don't forget to listen to a new season of our Catalyst podcast, where we take a closer look at this 60-year-old case and how our team pieced the evidence together. Just go to kxan.com slash Backbone Creek. And once again, that investigation continues tomorrow night right here on KXAM. All right, let's get to our Friendsgiving challenge because we have a big thank you to say tonight. Yeah, we had our biggest donation of this three-week period mm -hmm. so far from Harold and Elizabeth Ingersoll. They sent in $5,000 for the evening team. Uh, and we're very grateful for all donations, big and small. Don't get us wrong, uh, but certainly that one stood out for us here today. And yet we still need more than $25,000 for team evenings alone in order for us to get to our $75,000 goal here by next Wednesday. You can scan the QR code there on your screen or go to kxan.com slash friendsgiving. And if you haven't heard, your donation is getting triple matched, meaning for every dollar that you donate, it actually becomes three. So now's a great time to donate there for the Central Texas Food Bank. It all ends up in the same place, and that's helping families and individuals here in Central Texas who are in need. And we appreciate all of you who've helped out so far. Big weather story tonight is a cold front. You can't see it on clouds and radar because there's no clouds and there's no rain associated with it. Just a temperature change. There's the approximate location of the front. It's going to be sliding through Central Texas here just after midnight. And you can see two, three in the morning, we've got 50s. It is not going to be a huge temperature drop, but it will be a steady one in the morning. And many of us will start in the 40s, if not low 50s at 7. But it will be a little windy here at the beginning of the day. So upper 40s, low 50s, when you add wind, it feels a little extra chilly. And the story, the part of the story here tomorrow is that temperatures just won't warm up much. We've had mornings in the 40s and low 50s before, but we haven't had afternoons this season where our high temperatures in the afternoon have not got out of the 60s. And we're thinking a high of just 69 here tomorrow in Austin. And then the temperatures fall much more quickly tomorrow night with less wind and a clear sky. Speaking of that wind, the gusts tomorrow morning may wake you up early before your alarm, gusting in the 20 to 30 mile per hour range through the middle of the day, and then the wind really settles down as we head into tomorrow night. But with the wind and the dry air, there is a level three and four out of five fire danger along and east of I-35. So do what you can to prevent any fires from developing here tomorrow. Otherwise, a lot of sunshine, just a breezy, chilly day with a high of 69. We say chilly, but it's still within the range of where we should be for this time of year. Average is 70. And then we look ahead to Thursday morning. Easily our coldest morning of the season. Most of us outside of Austin getting into the 30s. Many of you in the hill country mid 30s or lower, which would mean frost. And there could be some places that actually start below freezing Thursday morning. That would be the first freezes of the season. Not going to cause any pipe problems, but you certainly want to protect your pet, uh, your pets and your plants with that type of cold. Temperatures keep warming through the weekend. 70s are back and then 80s Sunday through Tuesday of next week. This is KXAN Sports, brought to you by Thomas J. Henry. Good evening, all. Happy Tuesday. We're not talking enough about it being nine days from Thanksgiving. With this holiday, of course, comes for some responsibility. You have to take down a minimum 1,500 calories in that main meal and watch football because it's getting real, folks getting chillier and some football is getting serious. College football playoff rankings again coming out this Tuesday night. Texas stays at number three after the win over Arkansas, which technically means number two because the two teams ahead of them also in the Big Ten. So Texas, the highest ranking SEC team. Texas being ranked Number three in the country, a legitimate contender for a national title. Quite the far cry from how things used to be. Yeah, we probably show this video too much, but it shows how far Texas has come. Think about this senior class from that five and seven season when they were new to the program to now this level of success, a top five team consistently here in the country. Guys like Gunnar Helm, who have been in this program for a while, a veteran tight end for this Texas group has been here through thick and thin. On the defensive side, Jade Barron, a local product. Alfred Collins, same thing. David Benda, these guys that have been here through the whole Steve Sarkeesian era. Sark talked this week on what this class means and the players on how they got here. Super grateful for these guys and, and um, 
you know, I owe a ton to them. And, uh, you know, I, I get a little emotional about this stuff because without, th- without this group, we wouldn't be where we are. And so, I'm, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm very grateful and thankful for them. You know, I, I would just say with all those guys being in our class, this was, this was the class that had to lay the foundation, that had to get the culture turned around. And, um, you know, I think that uh, we've done a great job, but everyone's bought in. So um, it makes our jobs a whole lot easier. Okay, for Senior Day this week, John A. Barrett, it's his second time going through it. He was technically a uh, senior last season. A lot of emotions on Senior Day. We asked John Day about it. Listen to the end here. I don't know, because I did it last year, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. This one, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it was sad last year, but this one really, knowingly that I actually can't come back ever again. So I don't know, I'm, I'm going to drop some, some, some real gangster tears out there. <laughs> Gangster tears from John A. Texas Game Day, the official pregame show of Texas football this Saturday at 1.30 on KBVO. Texas football, as we said, number three of the country. Women's hoops number four as they continue non-conference play. They have the 40 acres field trip tomorrow. A lot of kids, elementary school kids, going to make a lot of noise at Moody Center. Vic Schaefer knows how big and special this day can be. And it won't be lost on my kids. Uh, They'll have a chance to, to maybe become somebody's role model tomorrow. They'll have a chance to, uh, you know, maybe impact some young person's life tomorrow. Maybe it'll motivate them to, you know, do better in PE class or uh, maybe even to pick up a sport. Texas and Charleston State, bright and early tomorrow. More sports over on KXA.com. All right, here's your forecast for tomorrow. A cool and breezy start. That 48 is going to feel colder than the 46 did this morning. 65 at noon, 69 for the high in the afternoon, and then near freezing for some of us Thursday morning. (laughs) All right, Vic, thanks so much. We hope you have a good night.